Let's talk about your home studio. You're a voice actor. You're an entrepreneur. You're a VOpreneur. Welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The Voice Sam Player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com slash markscott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com slash markscott. The Veopreneur Podcast. Hey, it doesn't suck. Not as funny as Conan. Not as cute as Seth Meyers. Not as smart as Colbert. But he's one of us, and that counts for something. Here's Mark Scott, the original everyday Veopreneur. Hello, and welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. I'm Mark Scott, the original Everyday VOpreneur, back with another episode of actionable, practical advice that is designed to help you grow your voiceover business. And this week, we are going to hit on a topic that is probably one of the most heavily debated topics that there is in voiceover. We're going to talk about the home studio. Now, I want to preface this episode by saying what you are about to hear in this episode is simply meant to be advice to help you get started with your studio. Sometimes I think that there's a lot of pressure in this industry to spend a lot more money than is necessary to get equipment that is a lot more equipment than necessary just so that we can measure up. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I have brought in my studio guru, the one who has been helping me with equipment choices, studio builds, getting my sound right, etc., 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 going back, I don't know, probably about 10 years. He's got a lot to offer. This is going to be a very enlightening episode. Even if your booth is already up and running, I promise you, you're still going to learn some things. Setting up your home studio is one of the most important things you'll do as a voice actor. With the right equipment and the right recording space, you'll be able to turn your training and your demos into a revenue generator. But... Trying to decide what equipment to buy can be confusing, can be overwhelming, and sometimes it can be incredibly expensive, except that it doesn't necessarily have to be. My guest today is my self-professed studio guru. He guided me through equipment purchases, studio builds, DAW setups, and more and more over my career, and he's done it for countless other voice actors as well. Welcome to the show, Uncle Roy. As well as producing two voice arts nominated killer demos one was the killer demo adventure where you actually came here when the borders before the pandemic when they let us go places yeah and maybe again later this year we'll see maybe one day they'll let us go places again you're right though we have done two killer demos together and both of them have been award nominated so Mm -hmm. i know that you're a good guy to talk to because i know you got all the answers so Let's do this. If you go into a Facebook group and you post the question, which microphone should I buy? (laughs) You are going to be left very confused because you're going to get 100 answers from 100 voice actors. And they're going to say, I have, and then insert the name of the mic here. So Mm -hmm. they're not actually answering the question, which mic should I buy? They're simply stating a personal factor of preference. Now, The range of microphones can be vast. You've got your $100 USBs. You've got your $4,000 Neumanns and all points in between. So talk to us about the difference between the mic we need, the mic we want, and the mic the masses suggest. People starting out want to, There's, I guess there's a fine line or, or the balance between how much money do I really have to spend do I spend a hundred dollars? You know, when the pandemic started, all the agents and managers sent out a list of equipment, but unfortunately it included these USB mics because they're cheap. Hey, plug it in and you're in business. Suddenly you're, you're, you know, and we can continue talking about mics, but unless your space is treated, and I know we'll get to that later, yep. it doesn't matter if you have a $4,000 microphone in a crappy sounding space. It'll be a great recording of crappy audio. So what do you want? You know, you can spend under $300 and get a decent mic. I don't know if I should be mentioning microphone names and models or what to stay away from. Uh, we try to stay away from any any USB and any really low. And if it's under $100, save your money 
and and wait till you have a little more. You know, for two hundred and seventy five bucks, you can get a decent mic. And the interface, of course, all the prices are going up now. But interface, you can get away with one hundred and fifteen dollars, one hundred twenty dollars. It's the same equipment I have here. I use them on demos. Mark has similar, some similar. Now Mark has upscale equipment. You know, he he deserves it. But that brings us to an interesting point, though, because I always had the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, right? So, you know, $150 interface, right? I, I right. had that. I've, that's what I've used for five years. I was using that with the 416. I was using it with a, a U87. And it's worked, you know, it worked great for me for about five years. Recently, it quit working and I needed to upgrade. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going with a Focusrite RedNet X2P, which is audio over Ethernet. And it's pro grade. And it wasn't so much that I needed to go to pro grade as much as it was I needed audio over Ethernet just because of how my space is wired. My space is wired with Ethernet. So right. I went with that interface, which is about a $1,200 interface. And I recorded in my booth on my 416 and on my U87 mm -hmm. with the 2i2 and with the RedNet. So $150 interface, $1,200 interface. I could not notice a discernible difference. Right. And so to the layman, is there a discernible difference between the $200 Scarlet and the $1,200 Apollo or... Are we just buying expensive interfaces because they're more fun or they have more features or that just sounds cooler or we we assume that people would take us more legitimately if we say we have an Apollo? But but from a sound standpoint, and you're the studio guy, mm -hmm. I don't notice a difference. Is there a difference? Things like the Apollo and Personas and even the SSL, they have extra buttons. Uh, the SSL has a button called 4K, and I was reading the review on it. I don't know, you know, SSL's company's been around for a long time. They make big recording consoles back in the day. So their name is very good. Do I want it to sound like an old SSL 4000 console? I hated those mic pre's. So I don't know if that's a big sell point for them. And maybe they've improved the, the design. You want something that's going to last, something that's robust. You don't want something that's feels like it's going to fall apart. The problem with some of the Scarlet, the Focusrite products is, at least on a, on a Windows machine, is that when Windows updates their operating system, it tends to co corrupt the drivers. So you can go to Focusrite.com, you can download new drivers, and chances are you'll be back in business. On a Mac, Mac doesn't really use drivers. So I think yours had just outlived its life expectancy. Same thing with computers. How long is your computer going to last? Mm -hmm. When is it time for a new computer? Uh, what's the minimum requirements for a computer? But let's stick with the microphones and the preamps. Um, I'm in the market for a new pre uh, interface. I like the Steinberg. It served me well. I think it's just time for something else. So I might try the SSL, the Audient. I'm not going to spend $2,500 on a mic pre. I'm not Joe Cipriano doing promo. It, so it also depends on what genre of voiceover you're doing. Do you need that extra processing? And if you do, you need somebody like myself or a dozen other people who we know, techs, to help you set these things up properly. It's great, you know, it's great to spend the money. The other advantage of having a more robust uh, interface or microphone is you can put it on your website and yes, people will take you more as a more legitimate, a more professional, you know, Mark, if you put 416 and 87, everybody knows you're really, you're the real guy. And similarly, uh, with your interface, you know, you can't put, I have a Scarlet 2i2 and a Audio-Technica 2020 mic. You can put that, but nobody will, you know, anybody who knows anything won't take you seriously. They're going to judge you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know, like with the Apollo, for example, I know that there are bells and whistles that come with the Apollo. My Redneck came with, like, something like $1,500 in bonus plugins that I could download. And there's all kinds of 
compressor this and gate that and EQ this. And I don't use any of that stuff anyway, because in most cases, the people that I'm recording voiceover for, they want just my raw audio to begin with. So having all of these extra bells and whistles doesn't really, for me anyway, it's not an advantage. So I'm assuming that's the case for a lot of us though, right? People want the straight raw audio so that on their end, they can do the engineering, the mastering, the processing, all of that sort of stuff. So do we need to have all that stuff on our side? Well, for clients who don't know how to do that, I mean, you could test the waters and send them, even if they say we want raw audio, there's certain things you can do on my list of <laughs> my two-hour Adobe Audition uh, life-changing thing. There's things you can do where they're afraid of over-processing. They're afraid of too much compression. And any of those external mic pre's that have compression and limiting and EQ, the people, if you're adjusting it yourself and you're putting headphones on, and boy, doesn't my voice sound good now. <laughs> you know, this isn't radio. You may not be a promo guy. What What is the final thing? You know, if it's gaming, let yeah, so let them do it. Let them do it. But you could give them clean audio. You can put a high-pass filter and whatever. You can run a declicker on it if you're extra clicky. But... Um, yeah, they, they're going to want to do the compression and stuff. So somebody like Joe Cipriano, who's been set up that this is the Joe Cipriano promo sound. Right. And may, maybe Dave Fenoy. So if somebody sets you up, somebody like me or George or Dan or Jordan, you know, whoever, then that's fine. That's fine. Let somebody else dial it in, do a Zoom session and let somebody else or if, or if they own the same equipment, say, okay, here's your starting settings. You know, put the threshold here, put the ratio here, and the release, and all those things. If you have a good, if you have a 416 or an 87, boy, you shouldn't need anything. The 87, which came after the 67, which came after the 47, none of those microphones were designed for voiceover. They were music uh, microphones. They happen to sound great on voiceover. You know, back in the days of radio, they were using ribbon mics and all kinds of stuff. But yeah, the 87, boy, that 87, as Mark knows, that 87 sounds really good. And I just did a demo with somebody and boy, I, I got a deal on an 87 and it sounded, it sounded great. The vast majority of my voiceovers are recorded on a U87. The podcast is recorded on the U87 and I don't do anything to it. I just record but that brings up another interesting point because so some of these interfaces like the Apollo, they do have bells and whistles that are built in different settings, plugins, compressions, all of that sort of stuff. Do we want to be doing that pre-recording or don't we want to do that post anyway? That, like, don't a, you want the cleanest recording possible and then you add stuff after the fact? That's a good point. I mean, think of a photographer ha or old school photographer had two or three chances to get it right. First thing is to capture it. So, okay, microphone should go directly to your interface and boom, right in. You know, or is there stuff they can do, lighting and different lenses and, and things like that to capture it correctly. So if you know what you're doing, if you're a great engineer, then you're trained to get it right going into the box. My, my chain is microphone goes to a DBX 286 because there's a little bit of compression and a little bit of DSing going into the box. But to your point, yes, clean audio in, and then you can mess with it later. Play, play with your plugins. Go ahead. Um, as long as it sounds natural and it sounds like you and doesn't sound like FM radio or over-processed gaming voices. If you're doing gaming voices, that's great. But chances are they're going to want to create those sounds. I know for me in the beginning, I was putting way too much compression on my stuff because it made it sound like a, you know, bigger, boomier voice. And now nobody wants that anyway. So they, they you know, they all want just the regular conversational natural voice. And so it's just it's one of those things to consider when you're trying to decide what kind of gear you want to buy. Like the fact that this Redneck came with all of these other plugins was not a sales feature for me. I'm like, whatever, I'm never going to use this junk anyway. 
I just need the interface. Some people like to play. Yep. Some, you know, it's great. Play with your sound. Uh, chances, you know, whatever you do, it's got to be, it's got to be subtle. It can't be in, so in your face that it's unnatural and undesirable to your, your client who then wants to put music to it, but it's so compressed. It, it, you know, it just it just sounds terrible. So if somebody helps you dial it in, somebody like myself, I set your compressor in your Adobe Audition and all that for your mic, your space, your voice, your style of delivery. There isn't a one size fits all mm -hmm. on any of these plugins. But yeah, you want to play, play. And then after you're done playing, save it and send it to me, send it to one of my colleagues who can say, nah, that's too much, too much processing, back it off. So if we know that we don't need to have a Neumann and we know that there's not a huge discernible difference between a Focusrite or a Steinberg and a mm -hmm. Apollo or an Audient or whatever, why are voice actors so often buying so much more than they need? Why are they spending so much more money than they need? Is it, is it a peer pressure thing? Is it an industry pressure thing? Is it a, a lack of understanding or education? It, it, like, what do you think it is from talking to, from all the voice actors that you talk to about studio equipment? I'm not going to get into the uh, PC versus Mac thing. No, but we know you should here. always, everybody should use a Mac. <laughs> so we don't need to have that argument. <laughs> <laughs> I have a nice MacBook Pro. It's sitting right here. It's what I keep my coffee cup on. <laughs> I'm an Apple shareholder. I, obviously, I want everybody to buy Mac. <laughs> no, this, I like Mac products. I don't like Apple's business plan of changing stuff and taking away things, taking away ports, and then putting them back and making you buy adapters right. and then releasing yep. operating systems that the things you own don't work anymore because they haven't done the research. I think, uh, I think isotope just released, um, M one compatible, uh, RX nine and all that, but Apple should have conferred with isotope and said, Hey, I know a lot of your, uh, a lot of our mutual customers use your stuff. Let's make sure it's compatible. So yes, there's a lot of peer pressure. So I was setting somebody up and not only did they have to learn Adobe Audition from me, but they had been pressured into, oh, you're doing voiceover, you have to have a Mac. And if you don't get a Mac, the person literally said to them, if you don't get a Mac, I can't help you with tech support anymore. And that, that, that was, may be I, a little extreme. <laughs> you don't want to help somebody, somebody who has a PC, that's fine. Send them to me. So I, I just don't like the peer pressure. It, not only... You get it from Source Connect. They're, they're very, they push and they develop more towards Macs. I'm ha happy to work either one. I do as much tech support for Macs as, as for PCs. So there's a lot of peer pressure. People say, oh, I, I, bought, a, I bought a 416 and a Mac. And they were PC and a Rode. And I said, peer pressure? And they said, yeah. Yep. So there's a little too much peer pressure. I it's good to it's good to get peer endorsement maybe or peer advice, but nobody should uh, shame you into something. Oh, you're not using this. Oh, then that's that's no good. I know. Like when I started, I was recording on an RE20, which anybody who's ever been in radio they've what seen the RE20, right? Generally assumed to be the worst possible voiceover microphone that ex oh. in in only existence. because it's a dynamic mic. It's right. not a bad it's it's a radio mic. It's a radio and mic. It's and not you're a, a radio guy. You're yeah. a radio guy. So I bought what I knew because right. I didn't know any better at the time, but I used that like I built a six-figure business on that microphone. Now, as my business grew, I reinvested back into the business. I upgraded microphones, I upgraded interfaces, I upgraded my studio space. I continue to do it one because I can, two because I need tax write-offs and three because I always want to make sure that I'm offering the best possible quality. But that doesn't strictly imply that anything less than an Apollo or a Neumann is bad quality. So for the voiceover actor who's trying to offer great sound on a budget because look when you're starting out there's a lot of places you got to spend money demos coaching websites all that sort of stuff 
mic and interface, like what do they need to be looking at in order to sound great? Because I know if they go online and ask on Facebook, they're going to get steered towards Apollos and Neumanns and 416s. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things, but not everybody can afford it and you don't necessarily need it. Nobody needs it. You said it yourself. You no. can't hear the difference. And it's not about your uh, the quality of your hearing. It could You said, I think you said at one point that it's very subtle difference. I mean, there's an obvious difference between my RE20 and my U87, 100%. Oh, yeah. But between my $200 Focusrite Scarlet and my $1,200 Focusrite RedNet, which is a pro-grade interface, there was no discernible difference. The other peer pressure or industry pressure is when you call places like Sweetwater, I can mention, and you and a total beginner asks, well, what, I need a microphone, and they recommend the wrong thing because they have it in stock. They're trying to get rid of them. These people at any of these supply places, the original purpose was for the music industry, and they don't really know. They, I think they're learning about what voiceover is and what what do they need because I do recommend stuff and I say go to Sweetwater because they have very good tech support and uh, they'll extend your warranty to two years but they they ill advise and I yelled at one of the didn't yell but I cautioned one of the salespeople I said listen don't recommend this mic anymore you know for thirty dollars more you can you can get a much better you know brighter is not better especially if you're a sibilant in the beginning, if you get a mic that's very bright, Rode NT1A is what I'm talking about specifically. And if I put that in a Facebook group, anybody who owns a 1A is going to defend themselves and say, oh, yep. mine works. I love my NT1A. Oh, yep. good, good. What? Hey, if it works for you, I've heard occasionally I do hear an NT1A that I can't tell. I can usually... If they send me this overly bright, I can guess that it's either, you know, a low-end Audio-Technica or a USB mic or, or a Rode NT1A. Sometimes I'm surprised. Sometimes it sounds pretty damn good, and then they tell me it's a NT1A, and I'm shocked. That brings up another valid point, though. Not all microphones are created equal, right? I have the 416. I used that for a number of years. Now I've got the U87. And they do sound totally different. Now you're spoiled. And I, I am. And, and I use the 416. There's certain types of auditions that I use the 416 for. I mean, the U87, would, I would definitely say it's the workhorse. But I've, I got the 416, so I'm going to use it. And there are certain things that it, it is better suited for. Are certain mics suited better for certain kinds of voices? And how do you figure that out before you place an order on Sweetwater? Yeah. A lot, you know, 416, yes, it's a great mic. It has its place. I don't care. It works for you, Mark. You know how to work that mic that it doesn't give me the, the thing that I hate about the 416. It's, it's an in-your-face mic. Yeah. So it, for promo and commercial and gaming that, and animation, that, it's great. But for an audio book, I, I wouldn't go with a 416 the other, the good and the bad of the 416 also is it's a hypercardioid. It's a very narrow polar pattern on the on the microphone itself. So you can't drift too far off the sweet spot, the center of where it picks you up. The good part about that is it rejects outside noise like you can hear now. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I got it was because I wanted something that I could use when I was traveling, right? I wanted something that worked in my home studio, but also something that I could use when I was recording in a hotel room or in a car or whatever. And, and it certainly does give me the ability to do that. And do you have two on the travels or it's the same one? Just the same one. Yeah. Okay. So you want to, you want your sound to be consistent yep. also. Whatever you did at home on the 416, you take that on the road. If there's a pickup or, you know, a, a same spot redoing yep. it you'll get the same quality but it's it's an in-your-face mic so yes. if if you if you work it too closely and you get mic proximity and plosives and all you know that that's not a pleasant sound for me and then if you process on top of that there's a time and place for that promo and you know on air 
things like that. But the 87, you can you can do anything. You you would never say, oh, you can't do promo on an 87 or you can't do gaming on an 87 because whatever post-processing they're going to do, they're going to do it anyway. Yep. So, yeah, there are certain mics. Again, I don't like a shotgun on long format because it's like somebody in my face for too long a period of time. That makes sense to me. I, and, and when I use it, like, well, most recently I booked a, a promo or a, like a trailer for a, a documentary and it was the type of read that they wanted and it worked great for that read. And I actually recorded the same thing. I recorded a version on the U87 and recorded a version on the 416 and I sent it and said, you know, use whichever one you want. And he used the, the 416 version. Yeah, so because that's a promo sound. Yeah. Like. And there is there is a difference for, for sure. So mm-hmm. is there a way that we can test them? What do you suggest? Well, do we go to a local <laughs> studio? Do we uh, like how do, how do you fig- how do you figure it out? Because, you know, you don't want to drop thousands of dollars on a microphone and get it into your studio space and then be like, yeah, this isn't the one for me. Some places will rent you a bunch of mics so that you can try them all out and then return them and just buy the one you want. Some people buy multiple microphones. I wouldn't say go spend thirty five hundred or four grand for an eighty seven because you want to try it. Uh, yes, I would go to a studio or I would borrow somebody's or Mark will give out his phone number. You can go to his house and <laughs> test out his 87. Lots of barbecue and do an audition on the 87 and sure. we're good to go. <laughs> See, I'm in the position to give license for how that uh, 87 is used, but we'll, we, don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to go there. Again, some places will let you buy multiple and return what you don't want as long as you buy something. Renting them is a good idea. Picking Stumps. up, picking a few that you want to rent, and and I'm guessing you go to what, like you go to a pro audio reseller, like somebody that sells so one of the uh, one of the voiceover schools, and maybe even it, it may even be one up in Canada, but I don't I don't remember who's got a whole bunch of mics that they would be willing to spare for two or three days for you to test out you know, under, uh, try different scripts and different genres of voiceover and try your promo read and try your, your, uh, conversational, you know, like we don't like converse. I'm, I'm not talking about your 416 specifically because I'm sure you can sound conversational, uh, you know, on that mic. It's not that the mic is going to make you, Oh no, I, I have to be Mr. Promo or Mr. On air, but, uh, try different genres in the different mics and see which one you you you'll probably hear that the 416 oh yeah that's that's what that's right in my face i really like that uh but again for long format that's that's not my favorite having your booth up and running is one thing having opportunities to get into your booth to record paid voiceover jobs is something entirely different and if you're not doing enough of that i want to help you VoiceOver Marketing Playbook is coming out again April 12th to the 21st, 2022. What's the playbook? It is a six plus hour video course that is designed to give you all of the foundations you need to learn how to get out there, find your own leads, build your own client base, and become the consistently working voice actor that you want to be. No fluff, no unnecessary rah-rah, just straight up actionable practical advice. Here's where to look for leads, here's how to contact them, Here's what to say. Here's how to follow up. Everything that you need to know to walk you through that process so that we can get that booth making money for you. Again, playbook available April 12th through the 21st, 2022. You can get the details at voiceovermarketingplaybook.com. That's voiceovermarketingplaybook.com. Now back to our show. So let's put a let's put a pin in, in the microphone and interface portion of this and give us if somebody wanted to try out a couple of different microphones and a couple of different interfaces and, you know, they're not going to get a U87 or a 416, they're looking for something that's a little bit more affordable, maybe something that's a little more entry level or whatever. What would you suggest are, are you know, two, three, four different microphones and maybe a few different interfaces that would be worth looking into or, or trying out to keep somebody from going into the Facebook group and getting overwhelmed with all the information? Another good place to look would be Facebook, uh, Facebook Marketplace, because I don't, <laughs> I, I told Mark this. I found I found an eighty-seven that was very affordable, and I could sell it tomorrow for thirty-five hundred dollars. Yep. but that was a rare find. Um, 
I love the Rode NT1, not the 1A, 2268 dollars maybe up from the and i also like the mxl cr89 i like the cad 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 e100s my second favorite would be the neumann tlm 102 that's only 700 bucks i most times don't like the 103 which is 1300 bucks uh and with that with the money we save we can all go out and get lobster and Sounds good to me. and everything yeah yeah um and we can fly j michael in he can have some too and the the 87 is is the top of the line i mean there are there are other there's warm audio has uh i know ted mcaleer loves the warm audio 87 47 and they're all they're all good products they all have different shapes to them they have all different curves you can look up the frequency response curve on any of these microphones if you just google frequency response neumann 87 and see and what you're looking for to avoid would be all this high-end high hiked up uh, high frequency boost because the intelligibility of voice is goes from 3000 and up to 5000 8000 and then it turns into brightness or sometimes they say air, it's got an air quality to it. But when you, when you have those high frequencies boosted like that, this, the S's get very crazy. So Rode NT1, Caddy 100S, uh, Neumann 102. Those are, those are my favorites. What about interfaces? I know you talk a lot about Steinberg. You have a Steinberg. I have the Steinberg UR22. If you don't need two channels, it's, it's very similar to the um, Scarlet 2i2. It's two in, two out. And the Steinberg UR22 is the two channel. So the Steinberg UR12, it's 115, 120 bucks. Uh, I'm, I wanna try, and then we'll get, we'll get back to you, but I'm gonna try, I think I'm gonna try the SSL or the Audient, one of those two. Uh, I, and I don't need any bells or whistles because my mic goes to the DBX. It's got bells and whistles in it. Then I just want to go straight into the right. interface. And then later I'm going to do all my Uncle Roy uh, tweaking and make it sound shiny and everything. Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier. We started to touch on it. So let's let's go there. We're, we've We've sorted out equipment stuff. But... Talk to us about the importance of the recording space, because you can go and get a U87 and an Avalon 737 and spend $10,000, but it isn't the solution to all of your voiceover problems. So talk to us about the importance of space. So most people know, so you guys can tune out at this point, the space has to be dead. And I, I've, I have yet to hear a space that's too dead. Yes, there is such a thing, but I've yet to hear it. You need carpet on the floor. You need all your hard surfaces covered, including your desk. You may have to angle your monitors so that there's no reflection. The biggest problem is usually the ceiling. If you're in a walk-in closet and you look straight up and there's a ceiling, oh, your voice is gonna, your sound of your voice is gonna hit the ceiling and bounce back into the microphone. So as much sound absorbing material as you can afford, or comfortably fit in there, you need a space that's big enough for you to do the physicality of the acting, hopefully. If there are clothes in a walk-in closet, that's great because clothes absorb sound. Sound won't bounce to the wall because the clothes are in the way. So Auralex on the walls or you know, sound absorbing panels that you can either build or purchase, hang them on the wall, the space is more important, really, than the microphone. If your space is crappy, it doesn't matter what microphone you have. So first thing is treat the space and then try all those different microphones in your space and see, see what the best sound quality is. Now, I see voice actors all the time posting pictures of their studio space, and they've got 100% coverage with foam. 
Like, I'm talking floor to ceiling, 100%. Sometimes they do it because it's, you know, looks pretty. It's a design thing or something like that. But is it necessary to have 100% coverage in your space? There's a certain part of life that is nice. Like in my rec room, I used to like to record open because the room sounded nice. But in a walk-in closet or even a whisper room, it's just a box. It's going to sound like a box. So I've got Oralex all round, and then I've got packing blankets on top of that. And then in the corners, I have bass traps because the bass frequencies tend to build up in the corners. So the short answer is yes, you need to treat as much, you know, if there's a shelf and there's the underside of the shelf and that's exposed, your voice is going to hit it and come back into the microphone. We don't want to hear it, you know? So I know when I was building the booth that I'm in now, before I even started doing anything, the very first thing I did was I called you and I said, I want to build a booth. What should I be thinking about? And one of the things that you told me was to put in an angled wall. And so I put in an angled wall. And now I've got some cloud panels hanging from the ceiling. It's carpeted. I've got a, a big panel, a foam panel behind me. And I've got some acoustic panels in front of me. The rest of the space does not have, you know, it's not floor to ceiling. And it, it sounds good. It's Uncle Roy approved. So when we're, when we're getting our space ready to go, or if we've got our space ready to go, how can we be confident that it sounds good? Because I know that I am not an expert there. And I know that people, you know, compare noise floor on social media like it's a badge of honor. But what, what sort of benchmark should we be looking for in order to determine, yes, I've got this right now. I've it's got a good, enough good panel, segue. blanket, whatever. It's a good segue into my free home studio evaluations. All right. Tell us about the home studio evaluation <laughs> because, honestly, it's worth it. Just record 10 seconds of room tone followed by a 30-second audition read. Please don't send me. Hi, Uncle Roy. I'm talking into my microphone, and I didn't have a script. That doesn't tell me what you sound like reading in your space. So read me a 30-second script, one file that has the 10 seconds room tone, and then the read all in one file. Please don't send me a separate file that says, here's my room tone, because the room tone is relative to the volume of your voice. That's what's signal-to-noise ratio. That's what it means. The signal is your voice, and the noise is your room tone. And anything below minus 60 is great. If you've got a studio bricks, chances are you're you're at minus 65 or minus 70. If you work with me, I will get your noise floor down to minus 72. That's my goal. <laughs> so send me your sample. I'll tell you what's up. I'll tell you what you need. If, the, if, if it sounds great, if it's not broken, we don't need to fix anything. You know, I, World Voices offers the studio assessment or the studio approval. I guess is what they call it. Not certification, approval. And I went through that process. After I worked with you, I went through that process. And I know that outside of the voiceover industry, nobody has any idea what any of that means. But I did it for my own peace of mind. I did it so that I know that the sound that I was putting out is good. And I think that's where, you know, taking advantage of something like you're offering right now is, you know, it's peace of mind so that you know that what you are putting out is good. If you've been submitting a lot of auditions and you're not booking, and maybe you think that it's performance related, but it could be sound related. And maybe it's something that could be fixed by adding a blanket or moving a panel, right? Like it's not always something complicated. Prior to you building that booth, we worked really hard back and forth, back and forth, move panels, move panels, yep. you know, move the, even the mic placement. If you happen to be speaking into a corner and the mic is there, bass frequencies could build up or it could sound boomy or boxy. And you don't want, you don't want a client saying, what's up with your sound quality? And I'm on the technical advisor board of Wovo. So you sort, you sort of had an inside, some inside feed on that. I know what they are looking for. So send me your sample. I will get you to a point that you could feel good submitting to Wovo if you're a member and get a, get approval. So in a perfect world, I know everybody would love to have a whisper room. I remember when I came to your place 
and recorded in the Whisper Room and was like, oh my gosh, I need to get one of these because it, it sounded amazing. And obviously Whisper Rooms are not cheap. Studio Bricks, again, beautiful booth, but not cheap. Do we need something that fancy or can it be, can you get good quality sound if you're in a relatively quiet space, like say you're in your basement or something, with PVC pipe and, and moving blankets, if that's what you got to do to start out? Yeah, in a, in a basement, you have to be careful of the furnace, the hot water heater, toilet flushing, you know, uh, HVAC outside the window. So as long as you take all those things in, you know, just whatever space you decide, sit in there very quietly for fu- three minutes and just listen. What do you hear? Oh, I hear traffic outside. No, that's not going to be good. Then you get window inserts to cut down the outside noise. So it has to be quiet, and then treating the space, yes, a PVC frame with producer's choice packing blankets that you can get from vocalboothtogo.com, that's absolutely acceptable. That will make a very dead, really good-sounding space. It's a little tricky if you're doing PVC, and if you have a computer that has high fan noise and you want to keep the computer outside the booth, Okay, then how do you have a second monitor, a second keyboard, right. and a second mouse? It's not like you can mount. Uh, but if you have a desk in inside your space and your computer's outside, you can do it. You can just get a just parallel your your monitor and have a HDMI uh, cable going into the booth. I think it's it. so important to have this discussion because, look, we all want to have the best possible equipment, right? We all want to have the Apollo that's tied into the Avalon that's tied into the U87 Save that's, your money. that's put inside of the, the studio bricks and right. We all want to have that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with aspiring to those sorts of upgrades. I mean, it took me a long time to get to a place where I could build the booth that I'm in right now. I, I recorded in a spare bedroom and it wasn't great. And I had to do a lot of stuff to, to make up for it. But I think it's important to have these conversations because I think There are a lot of voice actors that are spending way too much money out of the gate on equipment when that money could probably be better invested in things like training and demos and you record with slightly less fancy equipment and then that's something that you can upgrade down the road, right? Does it sound clean? Does it sound like you? That's all. We just want to capture your voice. It doesn't need big enhancements, you know. Yeah, we can do that in post. We got we have all the toys for post. But going in, you I mean if you do any processing going in, it's got to be subtle. You know, maybe a tiny bit of compression going in so that the peaks don't get away, but you don't want it to sound like it's coming off a radio or uh you know, going into a transmitter. That's not what the current trend sound quality is. I think that this is this is so good because there's a lot of information that I will crowdsource. And, and by crowdsource, I mean, I will go to social media and ask questions about various and assorted things. And you can get a lot of great feedback. I've got a lot of helpful advice from people in the past. I've got questions answered. It's guided me in a particular direction. I think, and, and maybe I'm alone in this, or I'm sure you're probably with me, but I think asking questions about home studio setups in Facebook groups is the quickest way to migraines and ulcers and confusion (laughs) because everybody uses something different everybody has personal preferences everybody's in a different space everybody's got a different budget right and and then you you start to get a little bit of imposter syndrome because you don't you know i don't have this microphone or maybe if maybe if i have this microphone it'll make me better or maybe if i buy this interface i'll convert more auditions or or maybe if I upgrade to this piece of equipment, it'll it'll make me book more or whatever. And we get all these things, all these messed up ideas in our head. I think that when it comes to equipment in particular, what mic do I buy? What interface do I buy? How do I get my sound right? I think that you are so much better served to just go to an expert and ask the question mm-hmm. and get one right answer as opposed to getting a thousand potential answers i think the only i mean youtube is so loaded with oh you know rappers and musicians and i use this mic i would trust uh booth junkie okay 
or if George or Dan did a review of a mic or a piece of equipment, I would consider that from a uh, reputable source or myself or Jordan. YouTube is just loaded with crazy stuff. So you can't, you can't trust everything. You can't, there's just, and there's just way too much information. It's so confusing. Like you said, it's time for a migraine. Uh, yeah. Ask, ask one of us or ask Mark and he'll send you to me. <laughs> and, and just to be, you know, we're talking about George Whittem, Dan Leonard, Jordan Reynolds. These are, you know, when we say, you know, talk to George mm-hmm. and Dan or Jordan or whatever, these are the guys. So if you see stuff from them, you know, they're reputable sources as well. But yeah, I mean, it's a no brainer to me if you haven't done it. And if you're not a hundred percent confident, take advantage of the studio assessment that uncle Roy is offering. So if somebody it's wants free. to do that, how do, where do we give us the specs one more time and tell us where to send it. And then I will yep. include that information in the show notes as well. Great. 10 seconds of room tone. Even don't be in the space, start recording. Don't be in the space, go in the space, read to me for 30 seconds, save as your name underscore raw dot wave. Email me shamefully at AO <laughs> Antland Prods. Shut up, Mark. Antland Prods, A N T L A N D P R O D S at AOL.com. I don't know. Shamef- can we trust somebody that's got an AOL email address? I don't know. Just means I'm old. <laughs> shamefully, shamefully not sorry. Or. If if you feel weird sending to AOL, then antlandproductions at gmail.com. I'll, I will check my Gmail more frequently. And it it's okay. I've sent all kinds of stuff to the AOL over the years, and I've always got a response back. So That's you right. can you can send it to the AOL, and, and, and Uncle Roy and will take if, a CD and put it in and dial it up. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a a, a quarter and, and a and a rubber band on the 56k modem holding it together because it's so old i just want to know does it still say you've got mail it does should See, i that that right there that nostalgia factor alone makes me want to go get an aol email address because i want it to be able to say oh i can't you've got mail i was gonna say let me log off and log back on but the clean feed is running through <laughs> aol right now so if i shut it off that'll be the end of the program but anyway 10 seconds of room tone, 30 second audition read, your name underscore raw dot wave, email to antlandprods, don't forget the S, antlandprods at AOL.com. If you don't hear from me, it's okay, bug me. Yes. Uh, you know, the, my, success is in the follow up. <laughs> the first time, the first time Mark announced this thing, I mean, over the course of, you know, a couple of months, 500 emails showed up. So I was, I was bombarded. Uh, and eventually, and sometimes Mark had to remind me, hey, so-and-so didn't hear from you. Okay, great. It's okay. Bug me. I can take it. I will put that information in the show notes. It's something that you should definitely take advantage of. Mm-hmm. Don't overspend on your equipment. Give yourself the opportunity to get established, start making some money. You can always upgrade over time. And hey, just to be clear, I am not trying to shame the talent with the U87 and the Avalon and the studio bricks. Like I want to be you, but I just want to make it clear that people understand when you're starting out, you don't specifically have to go there. I mean, I was using my first interface was a, a sure X2U, which some people probably won't even remember. Uh, and I was doing that with the RE20, which again, generally assumed to be the worst voiceover microphone in existence. It's a bass drum mic. And I, and I was recording that into, uh, it, I was, I guess uh, I, I had to use Pro Tools for a while, actually, because originally Adobe Audition wasn't available for Mac. Right. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, but I built a business doing it, recording in a spare bedroom, right? Like a 12 by 14 spare bedroom that I couldn't do a lot of treatment to because I was in an apartment and I was renting and it's not like I could hang stuff all on the walls and, you know, floor to ceiling acoustic tiles and all of that sort of stuff. And so I was very limited, but I found ways to make it work until I was in a position, you know, 10 years later where now I'm in a booth that I've custom built and I've got the U87 and I've got the pro interface and, you know, like I worked myself up to that and, which, and it's okay to do that. Which brings up another point. A wave is a wave is a wave, and an MP3 is an MP3 is an MP3. So it really doesn't matter what your DAW or software to capture your sound is. 
it does make a difference when you're doing cleanup and post audio. Adobe Audition is the only software or, or digital audio workstation that has auto heal for your leftover mouth clicks that Isotope might not get. Audacity is fine. It's free, but you can't use your Isotope plugins inside of Audacity. You'd have to do whatever you have to do in Audacity, take it out, put it in your uh, Isotope and spit it out. So that's a two-step process. I think that a... the, the, the DAWs, honestly, I think that's a whole other episode <laughs> in and of itself. Okay. Because, But it, it's a question that gets asked a lot, and it's a question that gets debated a lot. And, and you're right. A, a wave is a wave is a wave, right? So if you've got to record in something because you don't have the money to put out for Creative Cloud yet, that's okay. That's fine. You, you do that's what fine. you do, and you... And you find a way to make it work. So I think we'll have to do that. I think maybe we'll do a okay. we'll do a DAW episode down the road and have that conversation too, because I think it's definitely in that one that is that is worth having. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Uncle oh, Roy, yeah. for your time on the podcast. Thank you for being my studio guru for all of these years, ever since the day that you caught me wandering around lost in an <laughs> elevator at uh, WovoCon in Las Vegas. You've been my studio guru. We've built a custom studio together. You've set up my adobe on more than one occasion you've produced award-winning demos for me and so you are definitely somebody that i that i you, trust and then I'm, I'm glad to have I'll, you as a, as a resource in my network and to be able to share your wisdom with everybody else so thank you i'll never i'll never forget you put put we were in the elevator or you pulled me into the elevator and said i hate to i hate to be directed i hate doing i can only do rip and read <laughs> fix me yep that was That's it said. that then, was it then we, we then we fixed it. You fixed it. Yeah. All right. Thank you right. so much. I will post the information in the show notes. Take advantage of the uh, take advantage of the studio assessment and uh, look for the information in the show notes so that you can send your email and do that properly. Thank you so much for your time, Uncle Roy. Thank you. There is nothing wrong with aspiring to a U87. I dreamed about having a U87 in my booth for a lot of years. There's nothing wrong with aspiring to the 416. It took me about 10 years to get to the 416. What I hope you get from this episode is knowing that the equipment that you have right now, even if it's not the fanciest equipment, it might be good enough. It might be what you need to get some money coming in, and then you can ultimately take that money and reinvest it. Don't allow yourself to get caught up in the comparison trap on social media just because you don't have whatever the in interface is or whatever the in microphone is of the day, the week, the month, the flavor of the month, right? Don't get caught in that comparison trap. Make your studio sound great and you're good to go. As you book, set aside a percentage of your revenue, hold on to it so that when the time comes, you're ready to do some upgrades and then you get to have all of the equipment that you've always dreamed of. That's how I did it. I'm so thankful to Uncle Roy for the information that he shared. And by the way, all of the information on how to get your free studio assessment is going to be in the show notes. So check it out wherever you're listening to podcasts or at vopreneur.com. Send that email, get that studio assessment. Know that you can have confidence in the sound that you are sending out. As always, thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you on the next one. The Everyday Vopreneur Podcast. Available everywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Mostly we think. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The VoiceAmp player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voiceam.com slash Mark Scott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voiceam.com slash Mark Scott. And see. And that's a wrap. Thanks for hanging in. Thanks for hanging out. Want more Vopreneur goodness? Jump online at vopreneur.com. <laughs>